If you got your Bibles, will you turn with me this morning, if you have them, to Hebrews chapter number 2. We are in a series uh, at this moment. I'm preaching on great questions in the Bible. So far, I've taught and preached on, is there anything too hard for God? And when I look at God and look at my circumstance, I'm glad I know he's sovereign and there's nothing too hard for him. And then we continued on to the message, what must I do to be saved? That's the greatest question. And it's a question about salvation. I'm glad all you need to do is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And then we preached on who shall separate us from the love of Christ. And that's a question about security. I'm glad that neither death, nor life, nor angel, nor principality, nor power shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And then last week we preached on whom shall we fear? That's a question when we're scared, and sometimes we are scared. But I'm glad that God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of sound mind. And now today on our fifth message, I want you to notice a, qu a new question and look at it with me in verse number one of chapter two of Hebrews. I believe personally now, there's some argument about it that Paul wrote Hebrews. I, I, I attribute this to be his 14th epistle. Now, if you have another thought, I sure won't fuss with you about it because we won't know till we get to glory. Look at this, um, how this chapter starts. It starts with a therefore, and anytime you see a therefore, it points us back. Uh, to, he, uh, to the first chapter and when it talks about Christ being better. How many glad he's better? Hey, by the way, he's better than Muhammad. By the way, he's better than Buddha. By, by, by the way, he's better than the Pope. Amen. He's just better. Therefore, since he's better, since he's wonderful, since, since you, he, uh, there's nobody like him, therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how, here's the question, shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Which at first began to be spoken of by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that hurt him. Our Father, right now as I preach, I want to preach with power because I know what this passage means. And, and Lord, I know the te what the text is trying to say. And I'm in awe of it. And I see the seriousness of it. And God, help me as I communicate to this people. We're saved. We're on our way to heaven. We've been washed in the blood. It's wonderful to be a Christian, but Lord, it's a serious thing to be a Christian in these days that we live. And I pray now that you'll give me power to preach in Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. I want to preach today on how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, and that's a question of seriousness. 
I want to say this uh, as I barge into this passage. It's a serious thing to live for God. Somebody help me preach. We ought to take what we have in the Lord very seriously. As I studied this chapter, this is the first of five warnings that I found in this in the the book of Hebrews. It starts in Hebrews chapter number two, one through four, and it is this warning is about neglect. Then the next warning is found in chapter three, verses seven through chapter four and verse thirteen, and then it's a warning about hardening your heart. By the way, we ought not hard our heart harden our heart. We ought to keep a soft heart. I, you know what I see today? I see a bunch of people that's got their hard heart. Hey, somebody help me preach. And then I, in chapter 5, verse 11 through chapter 6, verse 12, we see a lesson about immaturity. By the way, if you've been saved very long, you ought to be mature. You ought to be complete. You ought to be a child. Why is it there are a lot of people in church that are so childish? Hey, by the way, Go check history. Most church splits never happen because of doctrine. They happen because somebody was childish. Amen. And then chapter number 10, verse 26 through 31, it's a warning about falling away. Then in chapter number 12, verses 14 through 29, it's a warning about refusal. I want you to notice the text today, and I want to hone in on it, and I'll give you three things, and I'll be brief this morning, but I want to be targeted this morning. Verse number one teaches us a call to attentiveness. Hey, by the way, we need to pay attention to our Christian life. We need to, have, we need to have, be attentive to what we're doing in the Lord. Somebody help me preach. We ought, hey, we ought to take seriously the work of God and the Word of God this morning. Amen. First of all, I want you to notice verse number one. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard. Our hearing of the Word of God. That really what that's talking about is when somebody publicly gets up like I am this morning, and preaches to you and exhorts you, you need to be attentive. And here's what you don't want to do. Say, well, I wonder who he's talking about this week. Like you're never in the conversation. By the way, the Word of God's for all of us. That means the preacher, that means the deacons, that means the staff, the word of God is for us all. And we ought to take heed and we ought to be attentive to public preaching of the word of God. Amen. Amen. Hearing the word of God. I got two things out of that. First of all, a preacher needs to preach it. Now there's two kinds of preaching really. There's what I call topical preaching. That's a preacher grabbing a text and going through the whole Bible to try to illustrate that text. That's topical preaching. And by the way, that's not my favorite kind, though I'll preach one every once in a while. But then there is what I call expository preaching. That's what I'm doing this morning. And that's when the preacher takes a text, he preaches that text, explaining the text, and exhorts people to apply the text to their life. By the way, that's real preaching to me. Uh, that's what we ought to do. Hey, we ought not ha 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 go to some pretext. We ought to need to preach the text of the Bible. Amen. Line upon line and precept upon precept. Amen. By the way, we need to be swift to hear. How many believes that? Y'all not just come to church on Sunday morning and just say, well, I got to endure one hour. No, you need to come to church and say, I want to enjoy an hour of worship. I want to hear the preacher preach because I believe he's going to give us something from the word of God. 
God. And I want it to stir me. And I want it to help me. And I want it to challenge me. And I want to be focused on God's word. Amen. Amen. Then our heeding of the word of God. We ought not just to hear it. And this bothers preachers. It bothers me. I'm going to tell you what, and this is not boasting on me, Brother Chad, or any of our staff who are all great preachers. But it bothers me when sometimes you get up and preach, and here's what you wonder. They get it. They listen. They apply this. Somebody help me preach. That ought to stir you. It's no time when you come to worship service to write notes to one another. And to look at your Facebook and see uh, your favorite like. Some, somebody help me preach there. I, I remember when I was a young preacher, and I'm talking about young. I'm talking about pre-27 before I ever came here. I'm talking about 23, 24, when I was a young man. And I was a, man, I, I preached like I do now. I just preached hard back then. And I never forget, I went to a church service, and I, I want you to know, I have seen it all in church. The church I was in, it, actually the building was no bigger than the choir loft here, if you kind of square it up. Seated maybe 75 people. So if you have a church that's no bigger than that, and you're preaching, you can see everybody. And uh, very first night I was preaching, I could take you to church. I ain't going to tell you which one it was because some of you know where it's at. And some of you have been there. And I could take you to the church, and I, Lois, I've seen it all. I mean, I've had people get up and speak in tongues in church while I was preaching, and I had to call them down. That, that's kind of spooky. <laughs> but I ain't never seen anything like this. I can tell you who, who these two people wasn't heeding the word of God. Because there's an old man about 68 years old. I mean, he looked like he was ancient. Some of you got your attention now, don't I? <laughs> and there was a young woman over here of 30 years old. I found that later. There was a young little girl of eight years old. I, 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 you, you can't make this up, okay? But I saw, I'm watching, I'm preaching and watching. I mean, you know, you got a building like that, you can see everything. He wrote a note down, handed it to a little girl. And the little girl crossed the aisle right in front of me preaching, handed to the 30-year-old. Then a little bit, the 30-year-old wrote a letter and gave it to the little girl and sent it back to the 68-year-old. And I thought, what's going on? And that happened about three times. I got after service. I said, preacher, I'm telling you, uh, I, I think you ought to fire me because I can't do nothing with them people that's passing notes in your church. And he said, who? And I told him. And he got red in the face. He said, do you know what's happening? That guy's got a thing for that 30-year-old, and they're passing notes in the church. God have mercy. I, 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 I'm not joking. I mean, sometimes I joke. Sometimes that ain't joking. That's serious. I want you to know something. We need to pay attention to the Word of God. We need to heed the preaching. Um, how in the world can somebody get occupied only on anything else than God's love and God's power? Amen. When you're in church, the Bible said, be ye doers of the Word and not hearers only. We need to hear the preacher preaches about a subject that's Bible. I'm not talking about running the rabbit, his personal preference. There's some, people, some Baptist preachers I know that make their personal preference convictions. I don't believe in that. Hello? And for instance, I've got a white shirt on. There's some Baptist preachers believe the only way you can preach is preach with a white shirt. 
I went to one church one time, had a blue shirt and wire rim glasses like this. I was scheduled to preach up north. When I got up there in my blue shirt and my wire rims, the preacher came by me and said, you can't preach today unless you can go to the motel and change your shirt and wear something other than wire rim glasses. How many of y'all believe that's ridiculous? Yeah. It's just ridiculous for somebody to get gets over the edge in their preaching and preach their preferences as convictions. By the way, there's enough Bible convictions and standards to preach without preaching about a wire rim glass. Am I preaching? And getting on something silly. This is serious. We don't need to get on frivolous, silly things. We need to stay in the Word of God and preach what the Bible says, not what we think. Am I preaching? Secondly, I want to call your attention. As I get into the heart of what I'm preaching, I really want you to pay attention good to this because this is the message. Notice this verse, verse 1. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them, what? Slip. I did a word study on that word slip, and Tyler, it's fascinating. Actually, this is a picturesque word. It's used in a variety of ways, and I want to give you four ways at least how this word is used in the Bible. By the way, when I look at Christianity today, we've seen a lot of things slip. How many? Hey, by the way, there's people that have abandoned the King James Bible. What do you say about them? They've slipped. There's people that's into this uh, rock and roll Jesus and hard rock Jesus. What do you say to them? They've slipped. There's people that have moved into the contemporary movement and changed everything and, and uh, worship has become entertainment. I'll tell you what they've done. They slipped. But this word actually has a deeper meaning than that. It's actually four of them. I'm going to give them to you this morning. First of all, that word slip talks about a distracted condition. What it talks about is like a person, one of you ladies, and I've seen my wife do this. I got too much fluid to do it. She'll get on every once in a while, she'll do this. You know what I mean, just, I, I, I think, well, she really glad to be married? I, I mean, you know. But every once in a while, she'll get active at that and, and forget and get distracted, and that, and that ring falls off. Like this morning, she slipped a little bit this morning. She can't find her glasses. She looked at me and said, where are the hell in the world am I going to know where your glasses are, honey? What she done, she kind of slipped this morning. She got distracted. I tell you what she done sometimes. She does this. Well, I'm preaching about you, honey. I'll tell you what. Uh, she does this. I guess it's because of me. She, everything's blamed on me. Somebody help me preach. <laughs> and she says, where's my glasses? Hell, what do I know? She ain't got my 15 cents of them. I ought to have said, what glasses? Your blue ones, your pink ones? Your brown ones, your orange ones. But she just, her mind slipped and she got distracted sometime and she put it somewhere and you couldn't find it, could you? Amen. I want you to know something. Sometimes we let things distract us. That's what that word means. How many of you have been guilty of letting something distract you? Letting a person distract you? Letting the circumstance distract you. Let, let activity in the world distract you. I remember a funny story I, about being distracted. It, I, never, I never forget it. It was a funny story. 
they was uh, six pallbearers taking a lady out. She had died, uh, and uh, out of the uh, out of the church, and uh, they kind of they uh, they got distracted, and they hit the wall. And all of a sudden, when they hit the wall, they heard something moaning. <laughs> Opened the casket, and that woman come out and said, and and. And Tyler, she lived 10 more years. Then she finally died again. And they were going out. Husband said, please watch the wall. (laughs) Uh, You'll get that later. (laughs) That's distraction. Then secondly, I see a distant condition. Here's what it describes. It it describes a ship being anchored properly and being tied off properly. But after time, the wind and the current causes the rope to slip. And before long, that rope got longer and longer, Chad, and, it's, and that boat kept sipping out into the ocean until the rope finally gave away and the ship was gone. Tyler, if you would, I want you to come up here. I want to illustrate this. Not that you're a ship, um, but how many remember when you got saved? By the way, this getting away from God isn't like this. Here's what people think it's like, that you get away all of a sudden. That's not it. That's not it. Here's how it starts. Remember when you got saved, how close you was to God? And then the winds of this world and the pressures of this world and the current of this world started taking effect. And you thought, well, it won't be so bad for me to miss a Sunday night. And here you are. You're you're still close. And then I just go ahead and quit Sunday nights altogether. And then I think I'm going to stop coming on Wednesday night because that teaching is boring. Then I just stopped Wednesday night. And then I was faithful on Sunday morning. And I just think I'll move a little further away. And I slip a little further. Until now, I don't even go but on Easter and Christmas. And now I'm all the way over here, out of church. No testimony. I'm so far from God. And you can blame it on the preacher. You can blame it on everybody. But it was you that slipped. Get your eyes off of people and keep them on the rope and keep it tied tight. Because the currents of this world have to get you away from God. And that's exactly how backsliding happens. It don't happen. It don't happen all of a sudden. It's a gradual process. Thank you, Brother Tyler. How many say amen to that? Then thirdly, that word slip, it's amazing. It talks about a dry condition. It talks about a vessel that gets dry and cracked, and the cargo of that vessel leaks out because of the dryness. The Bible said when we are saved and we get close to God, we're filled with the fullness of God. The Bible says that we ought to be filled with the Spirit of God. The Bible said about Samson, he wished not the Spirit had departed from him. You know what? The Spirit can depart from you and you never know it. And I'll tell you, this is a bad place to get in church, just dry. 
It's happened all over America. I used to preach all over America. I don't preach like I did before. And I'm going to tell you what I see in churches. They're so dry. It's all the fluids leaked out. The power of God's gone. Have you caught yourself getting dry? Just dry. I mean, you don't mean to be, but that, that joy's gone. That fervency's gone. That closeness is gone. It's just dry. I mean, you, you hear songs like those sing this morning. My God, every one of us ought to have been shouting over it. We're redeemed. We're washed in the blood. But I'll tell you what's happened to us. Our dryness has took our joy away. I don't want to lose my joy. Am I preaching? Isn't this word magnificent? Also, that word slip means a defeated condition. Actually, the root word of it means this, Brother Lance. It's amazing. It means... To flow like a river. That's what the root word of slip means. To flow like a river. And here's really what it's saying. Here's what the devil wants to do. Ultimately, the, he wants to get you defeated. He ha, he'll distract you. Come on. He'll distract you. Then you'll dry up. And you'll get distant from him. But all the purpose is for one reason, to defeat you. How many people you see today is defeated Christians? I know people get discouraged and defeated. But God doesn't stop and wait for you to get over your hurts, your disappointments, and your dislikes. His work is like a river that's flowing by you. And it's sad that many are out on the bank. We ought to take it seriously and not in the work of God like we used to be. Sunday night I'll be here in a little bit. I wonder how many be here. People lost their joy. And we just don't take it very seriously. Lastly, I'm I'm done. Let's let's look at the the question, and we're done. For if a word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedient received a just recompense of reward, here it is. How shall we escape if we neglect? So great a salvation. Now, I've heard preachers preach, and Chad, this is actually inaccurate, though it's okay to apply it this way. They have preached that this text is talking to sinners, and they are neglecting salvation. No, you've got to have salvation before you can neglect it. And it Paul said this, how shall we escape? He talked about himself and them. How, how, how are you going to escape if you neglect so great of salvation? I did a word study, Jeff. It's interesting. Matthew 22, 5 says this, but they made light of it and went their ways and one to a farm and one to his merchandise. And that word made light actually is the word neglect. In other words, we take our salvation so lightly. Amen? It's called a great salvation. i tell you what's great. It's because it has a great Savior. i tell you what's great. It's because the Scripture talks about it. i tell you what's great. It'll give you a supreme change if you ever get it. It's vast. It's mighty. And when we don't obey what God tells us, we don't attend properly. We don't tithe properly. 
We don't serve toply, properly. Here's what we do. We forget. Come on, look at me. We forget how much he loved us and came and died for us. I'll tell you what we forget. You remember how burdened you were with sin when you got saved? You were, weren't you? I'm glad my sins are gone. Jeff, we forget the forgiveness that he's bestowed upon us. And we forget that we've got eternal life. And we can't be lost. And we're on our way to heaven, even when we're bad. And we forget. We're getting close to Thanksgiving. And how many of all... How many of you in this room agree we ought to be the most thankful people in the world? But we have forgot what he done at Calvary. We forgot the nails. We forgot the, the thorns planted in his head. We fought, forgot the lashes on his back. We fought, forgot the blood he shed. Oh, God, help us not to neglect or take lightly what he done at Calvary. I'm closing. Then we take our sin lightly. It, look what it said in verse 2. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast and every transgression. By the way, that word transgression means stepping over the line. And disobedience, that means not being attentive. Received a just recompense of reward. I tell you what, here's what makes Christian different today than it was even 10 years ago. I, I'm saying 10 years ago. Y'all have no idea pastoring a church for 45 years and you see the change in culture and people. What used to be sin to them is no longer sin. They take it lightly. I thought I'd read you something as I get ready to close. It is entitled, We Can't. That's what it's entitled. We can't sow a bad habit and reap a good character. We can't sow jealousy and hatred and reap love and friendship. We can't sow wicked thoughts and reap a clean life. We can't sow wrong deeds and live righteously. We can't sow dissipation and reap a healthy body. We can't sow self-indulgence and not show it on your face. You can't sow disloyalty and reap loyalty from others. You can't sow dishonesty and reap integrity. You can't sow profane words and reap clean speech. You can't sow disrespect and reap respect. You can't sow deception and reap confidence. You can't sow untidiness and reap neatness. You can't sow intemperance and reap sobriety and temperance. You can't sow indifference and reap nature's reward. You can't sow mental or physical laziness and reap responsible position in society. You can't sow cruelty and reap kindness. You can't sow wastefulness and reap thriftiness. You can't sow cowardice and reap courage. You can't sow destruction of others' property and reap protection of your own. You can't sow neglect of the Lord's house and reap strength and temptation. You can't sow neglect in the Bible and reap a well-guided life. Amen. You can't sow thistles and reap roses. Lord says, you go to the piano and I'll close. I'll close with eight sentences. I'm going to give you eight sentences. And I'm closing. You cannot neglect worship. 
because it leads to wandering. You can't neglect prayer because it leads to a lack of guidance. You can't neglect the Bible because it'll lead to ignorance. You can't neglect faithfulness for church because you'll lose fellowship. You can't neglect giving because it'll lead you to financial problems. You can, cannot neglect ministry because it will lead you to floating and have a loss of purpose. You can't neglect your family without getting division and possibly a divorce. And here's a serious one. You can't neglect getting saved. You listen? Because it will lead you to hell. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation. Heads bowed, and you stand for me, please. I want to ask a question of the Christians first. How many Christians in this room will be honest? Because this is serious. We'll be honest. Preacher, I've slipped some. I'm not as close as I used to be. I, I'm not the Christian I used to be. I've slipped some, preacher. And I've neglected some, preacher. And I want you to pray for me. I need to get back close to God. How many Christians slip up your hand with honesty and say, that's me? Just all over the house. Just say, pray for me. Yes. Yes. How many people in this room that you're not saved? Let me ask, first of all, how many people saved? Raise your hand. Ah, if you're saved. How many right now say, Preacher Smith, I'm not saved. I've neglected God. God's given me chances over the years. I've had chances to be saved, but I keep saying no. Sir, there'll be a last no. And when you say it, that's hell bound for you. But how many here say, Preacher, I'm not saved, but I don't want to go to hell, and I want to be saved, and I want the joys of salvation. Pray for me. Slip up your hand. Slip it up if you're not saved. Raise it high if you're not sure. High, high. Our Father, I pray right now that be Christians who, who they're saved. I believe they love God. Lord, but they've slipped. They've slipped, and they're neglecting the great salvation. Lord, just help Christians come around this, their seats and come up around the altar and pray and talk to God. In Jesus' name, amen.